Welcome to the Intel Cordis Prime Software Design Series Timing Analysis Online Training Part 4 IO Interfaces. My name is Steve. In this course, I will go over the basics of constraining IO interfaces. Here are the recommended prerequisites for this course. An online training called Time Analyzer Introduction to Timing Analysis that can be found on the Intel FPGA YouTube channel or on the Intel FPGA Trading website. Knowledge of FPGA architecture and the design flow, and familiarity with the Intel Cordis Prime Pro software. If you haven't done so already, check out our previous courses listed here in this series of online trainings. Constraining your design tells the software tools your desired timing goals so that the fitter and timing analyzer can properly report back if your design can properly operate with the timing requirements. To constrain your design, you will need to understand the timing of the system environment such as the board delays and timing requirements of the other components connected to your FPGA. What if your SDC file is not exactly right, or some constraints are off by a little bit, or some constraints are missing? It probably does not sound like too big of a deal, but these incorrect or missing constraints can cause the fitter to make incorrect optimization choices and potentially spend too much time trying to reach timing closure in certain areas of your design where timing is more restrictive than necessary. And when the fitter works unnecessarily hard, then other areas of the design will suffer as a result. Not only will the fitter spend time on unneeded constraints, but the time analyzer will spend time processing the incorrect constraints. This course is about writing STC files for common Intel FPGA design situations. For questions about writing STC, refer to these user guides and online helps. And there is the tickle and command line help as well. I point out the tickle and command line help because they are installed with the Intel Cordis Prime. When you're in the Intel Cordis Prime user interface, and you want a quick reference for a particular command, such as what are the arguments for a certain SDC constraint, if you're in the Tickle console in Cordis or in the console in the Timing Analyzer, you will notice the question mark at the left side of the slide. Click on the question mark, and that will open the command line and Tickle API help GUI as shown. It is basically the reference guide for anything scripting. Highlighted here are the SDC and extended SDC commands. The SCC section are all the standard entered SCC commands from the SCC specification, and the extended SCC are commands that Intel has added. In this training, I will be going over SDC constraints for I.O. interfaces. I'll first go over the basics for constraining I.O. interfaces, and then I'll expand on those basic concepts by going over some more complicated examples. Incoming and outgoing FPGA data with their known timing relationship to the FPGA clock need to be constrained to ensure the success of the data transfers between devices. Part of the I.O. constraints deals with using virtual clocks, which we will see how to use in the coming slides. A virtual clock is a defined SDC clock that does not have a target. When defining virtual clocks, you must use the name argument in the create clock SDC command. The virtual clock does not directly interact with the FPGA design, but is a representation of the off-chip clock that launches the incoming data or latches the outgoing data. As a result, the virtual clock is used in the I.O. constraints. In this example, the FPGA is in the center of the system. On either side of the FPGA, I have application-specific standard products. ASSP1 launches the data to the FPGA, and ASSP2 captures the data from the FPGA. While this diagram does show two separate ASSPs, they could be the same device. There is a common oscillator to drive all three devices on the board, so we know that there is a common relationship with all the clocks on the system's board. Here's how we will write our SDC commands with the example system that I have. The FPJ clock is referred to as the base clock and is the first create clock command that we see. Since all the clocks are coming from the same oscillator, they will all have the same period, which is 10 nanoseconds. 
I will now create virtual clocks for the two other devices with the ASSP that launches the data getting the clock 100 in virtual and the ASSP that is latching the data getting the clock 100 out virtual. Using a virtual clock for the I.O. separates the I.O. clock from the core FPJ clock, which means that all of the uncertainties inherent with the FPJ are minimized to account only for the I.O., thereby making timing analysis more accurate for the I.O. constraints. Also, the virtual clocks will show up as separate clocks in all the related time reports, making it easier to analyze the reports when focusing on the I.O. paths. And there are some IP that can only be accurately constrained using virtual clocks, for example, with the DDR interfaces. There is the phase-shifted clock associated with the data, which means you can more easily describe a phase-shifted clock when you use a virtual clock. You will use one of two sets of data when constraining I.O., and which set of data you will use will depend on what information is given to you. Sometimes we have all the information in regards to the clock performance of the chips, the board delays, the clock skew, and so forth. Sometimes the information that we get tells us that the FPJ has to meet certain timing requirements in order for the communication between the FPJ and other chips to work flawlessly. Here's an example to illustrate synchronous inputs. There's a common oscillator driving the SSP and FPGA. The delays of the clock going to the SSP is noted as T clock to virtual. The clock delay to the FPGA is T clock FPGA. The virtual clock that I will use will have its starting point at the clock port of the SSP. The clocked out time of the SSP is noted as TCO. The board delay timing parameter is T data PCB. The delays internal to the FPGA are T data int and T clock int. I don't need to worry too much about those because the fitter will manage those delays based off of the input delay that I will add. Set input delay is the SCC command that I will use to constrain my synchronous inputs. I'll use the external delays described on the previous slide to help complete this constraint. The following slides will help fill in the details. Looking at the common arguments for the set input delay, firstly the clock argument is where you will put the name of the virtual clock. The virtual clock will have already been created using the create clock constraint without specifying a target for the create clock command. The delay value is the value in nanoseconds that you will use. The targets are the synchronous ports that you are constraining. You can tell the software if this clock is a falling edge triggered clock rather than the default of a rising edge triggered clock. The max and min values will accommodate the variations that naturally exist on printed circuit boards and in silicon. The max delay is the longest possible delay, adding all the different delay numbers together, and likewise, the min delay is the shortest possible delay. These differences in values will help determine the setup in the form of the max delay and hold times in the form of the min delay needed in the FPGA to properly capture the data. Here are equations to help in generating the max min values for the set input delay constraints. For the max value, you add the maximum clock to out of the SSP to the maximum board delay and subtract the minimum clock skew. If you are required to work with only the FPGA, then the maximum delay is the clock period minus the setup time. To find the min value, you do the opposite in that you add the minimum board delay to the minimum clock to out of the SSP and then subtract the maximum amount of clock skew. If you need to focus on the FPGA, then all you need is the hold time requirement. On the input side, the virtual clock was launching data. On the output side, the virtual clock is latching data. The virtual clock is associated with the clock port of the ASSP, which is receiving the data from the FPGA. The goal of the set output delay constraint is to be able to launch data from the FPJ with enough time so that the downstream device can capture the data. Since the fitter is timing driven, the fitter will now place and route the design based on the constraints to try to meet the timing. The goal of the set output delay constraint, just like with the set input delay constraint, is to tell the software how much of the external time requirements will consume the period constraints inside the FPGA. Set output delay has the same arguments as the set input delay. 
The clock argument is the name of the virtual clock that you have defined with the create clock command. The max and min values are used for setup and hold value calculations. You need to tell the software the ports that you are targeting, and you can specify a falling edge clock with the clock fall argument if data is being captured on the falling edge, as is the case with DDR. If you do not specify the clock fall argument, then the default is a rising edge clock. The max option of the set output delay command is the FPGA's maximum clock to output time to leave the FPGA and still meet the ASSP's setup time requirement. Likewise, the min option is the minimum amount of time that the data can leave the FPGA and still meet the ASSP's hold time. Here are the equations to use to figure out the max min delays given the timing information that you have. For the max value, take the maximum board delay add the ASSP setup time, and subtract the minimum amount for the clock skew. The clock skew is the difference in time that the same clock edge reaches their respective parts. When using only FPJ timing number, take the clock period and subtract the clocked out time. For the minimum value, you essentially do the opposite of what you did for the maximum value. Subtract the external parameters of the hold time and the maximum clock skew value from the minimum board delay, or if you need to use the FPGA numbers, take the negative of the clocked out time. Here is the GUI option to help you fill in the set input delay and the GUI option for the set output delay has essentially the same setup. As you fill in the parameters, the SCC command data field gets filled in. Here is an example putting the set input delay and set output delay constraints together. The board has a 10 nanosecond period. I created virtual clocks for ASSP1 and ASSP2. The clock skew ranges from a maximum of 0.5 nanoseconds to negative 0.5 nanoseconds. The trace delays from ASSP1 to the FPGA and from the FPGA to ASSP2 are both 16 nanoseconds. ASSP1 has a maximum clocked out of 5 nanoseconds and a minimum clocked out of 3 nanoseconds. ASSP2 has a setup time of 2 nanoseconds and a hold time of 0.4 nanoseconds. Using the equations from the previous slides, with the supplied numbers gives me the delay value shown here. The maximum delay value for the set input delay constraint is the maximum board trace number minus the minimum clock skew plus the maximum clocked out of ASSP1. The values for the other delay numbers are done in a similar manner with the prescribed equations. One thing to take note is the register in the ASSP2 device in that it captures data on the falling edge of the clock, so the set output delay uses the clock fall argument rather than relying on the default clock rise. Here's a good way to make use of Tickle in your SDC file since SDC is derived from Tickle. The list of variables are defined first in the SDC file based off of the timing numbers that you have from the devices and the board delays. Creating these variables will make any changes to the timing numbers easy since you'll just have one location to worry about to change your numbers. From these initial variables that you create, the clock skewed numbers can now be created. In Tickle, whenever you need to do any sort of mathematical expression, you have to precede the expression with the expr keyword, then create your math expression as shown in the example. Using SDC with variables in this manner helped to make a more readable SDC file. Once you have your I.O. constraints entered, how do you check to make sure that the constraints are honored? Use the Report SDC report in Timing Analyzer. The Report SDC Timing Analyzer command reports on all your constraints that you entered in your SDC file, so it is a good report to check if the set input delay and output delay constraints were entered properly or not. You should also run the Report Unconstrained Paths to verify that all your paths in your design are constrained. This report will also point out inputs and outputs that have not been constrained. You do want all the unconstrained paths down to zero. In the previous slides, I covered the essentials on constraining inputs and outputs. Now for the essentials, you should be able to use these SDC commands in addition to other SDC commands to constrain more complicated interfaces. If you're configuring your own source synchronous interfaces, then other constraints will need to be considered in addition to the set input delay and set output delay constraints. Most, if not all, the more advanced interfaces that come in the form of IP will already have their own SDC file. 
Refer to the individual IP user guides for more information about potential additional SDC commands that you'll need to add. An example of a more advanced I.O. interface are the external memory interfaces. When you configure these interfaces, you will enter a variety of parameters to match your system. The software will then use these parameters to generate the appropriate SDC files for the IP. The IP files become a part of the project and are read in during the fitting process along with doing timing analysis in Timing Analyzer. Another example that I would like to mention is the Certes block. This IP is the high-speed serial I.O. that serializes the data before leaving the FPJ and deserializes the data that comes into the FPJ. When configuring the IP, you input the parameters such as stating how wide the data will be from 3 bits up to 10 bits wide, and parameters about the board level skew between the data and the clock. For more information about the LVDS Certes Intel FPGA IP Core, please refer to its user guide. There are IP specific reports that you can generate if you are using either the LVDS Certes IP Core or the hardened memory interfaces. These reports will give you a timing analysis of these IP and what kind of slack margin you will have. For the Certes Core, there is the receiver input SKU margin abbreviated as the RSKM value. For the memory interfaces core, there are significantly more numbers to look at and consider to make sure that your interface is meeting timing. In summary, I covered the basics of constraining for IOs and went over a couple of examples of Intel FPGA IP complex IO and their respective generated files. This concludes part four of a five-part series. I encourage you to check out parts one through three if you haven't done so already, along with part five of the series listed here. There are many ways to get training about Intel FPGAs. You can watch hundreds of videos on our Intel FPGA YouTube channel, register for our e-learning classes on our Intel FPGA training website, or enroll in one of our regularly scheduled instructor-led online classes. Not only do we have quality classes, but they are also free of charge. If you still have questions about our FPGA products, visit our online forums. One more thing. We are always looking for ways to improve our training. Send us an email with your feedback about the course that you attended. My name is Steve and thank you for listening to this course, 